over to you folks. Great. Thank you. And uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Interdisciplinary Museum Learning, Lightning Talks on Utilizing the Museum Space in a Higher Ed Learning. Um, today, we're going to explore how uh, utilizing museums can enhance and extend learning across disciplines. Some of my fabulous colleagues that you see on the screen here uh, who have incorporated the museum into their syllabi and pedagogical practice will share about the experience. Um, and I want to um, encourage you to utilize museums in your teaching because I see them as spaces for transformation and experimentation. So um, here are uh, the, sort of the four things I, I wanna briefly touch on. Um, oh, my name is Zachary Bowman. <laughs> I'm the manager of education and visitor experience at the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art, which is located here at SUNY New Paltz. Um, sort of the four things I'm gonna touch on are um, <clears throat> the following. Offering a positive museum experience can encourage lifelong museum visiting habits and increase students' cultural capital. The museum offers applied experiential and cognitive learning opportunities. Museums can make challenging ideas accessible and provide opportunities to have tough discussions on polarizing topics. Uh, and the museum provides social learning opportunities and can get students excited about applying what they're learning in the classroom. So um, <clears throat> in terms of positive museum experience, studies have shown that students who visit museums have higher test scores, a greater sense of social responsibility, and an increased appreciation of the arts. But I really truly believe that they also can be spaces transformational spaces. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a personal anecdote. Uh, this is me when I was 15. And although you probably can't tell from this kind of smug look on my face and my really classy shirt from Gadzooks, uh, I had never been to an art museum by this point in my life. It was that year later uh, that I first visited the Dallas Museum of Art. My friend Becca uh, is definitely not gonna be happy with me sharing this picture of her. No, she knows. Um, I was really nervous and felt out of place when I went to the Dallas Museum of Art, but a kind security guard greeted me and made me feel welcome, which was a huge part of why I had the confidence to proceed. That day at the DMA, I passed by a lot of strange abstract paintings, landscapes, and nothing much which at the time caught my eye. And then I came upon this work by the artist David Wonorovich called This Boy. It features of the artist as a young boy surrounded by uh, text with lines such as, one day this kid will feel something stir in his heart and throat and mouth. One day this kid will find something in his mind and body and soul that makes him hungry. One day this kid will do something that causes men who wear the uniforms of priests and rabbis, men who inhabit certain stone buildings, to call for his death. One day politicians will enact legislation against this kid. At the very end, it says, he will be subject to loss of home, civil rights, jobs, and all conceivable freedoms. All this will begin to happen in one or two years when he discovers he desires to place his naked body on the naked body of another boy. It resonated so deeply with me and helped me expect my, accept my humanity while grappling with being a gay kid in Texas. And it made me realize there was the place for me in this institution, which changed the course of my life. I credit that security guard's kindness, and it's why I made a career out of making people feel not only welcome, but empowered with a sense of ownership when they come into museums to break down barriers and remind them that they have agency in this space. I grew up in an environment where I spent most of my time with television and later the internet. Museums provided me a, a place to consider the world uh, more deeply. Um, the museum offers applied cognitive and experiential learning opportunities. So applied learning, right, learning by doing. Students uh, learn by engaging in direct application of skills, theories, and models. Uh, in museums, students can apply that, the knowledge that they've gained in their traditional classroom um, in a hands-on real world, world setting. Um, for instance, I had a journalism one class come I treated the class like a, uh, they were uh, the marketing department and I was giving a tour for the marketing department uh, upon the opening of an exhibition. After the students, the teacher asked the students to conceive pitches for the exhibitions based on the museum and the work that they saw. Um, we also provide opportunities for our art students to um, uh, uh, have uh, their work shown in the museum, but also 
do gallery talks, sort of do the things that they will be uh, uh, asked to do later in their career. Um, experiential learning occurs when people stretch their minds. I feel like I'm telling the teachers what learning is. I know you know. Um, but it, you know, when, when uh, 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 they're stretching their minds to interact with inter uh, information and experiences at hand, um, which involves acting on available information, um, including one's own thoughts and feelings. Um, and so when you actually view this experiential learning cycle of the sort of the activity reflection conceptualization and application, it looks a lot like what I was taught to do uh, at, at my time uh, at the Museum of Modern Art, um, <clears throat> which is that we in, in, invite participants in tours to engage uh, works by observing, describing, interpreting, and connecting with the work. We're asking them to formulate their own questions, reflect on their own ideas and impressions, make their own judgments, construct their own interpretations, and seek their own personal connections. Um, and that's something that just, it happens in museums, right? There's an object, you can see it, you can question it, you can think about it, you can sort of reflect on it. Um, so in terms of um, cognitive learning, right? That's learning by building memories and connections. It's, uh, uh, and, and therefore sort of developing knowledge um, about content and process. And trips to museum offer these learning opportunities beyond facts beyond uh, concepts by encouraging students to respond to and connect with art objects, viewing them firsthand. And this is a really a two-way street. This happens for me uh, just as it happens for students. Um, this is an image by Harold Edgerton uh, called Bullet Through Apple. Uh, I always um, uh, talked about this work with students in the museum as um, how it was a, a, an image taken to showcase the electric flash. Uh, which Edgerson had recently invented uh, in his uh, lab at MIT. Um, but I had this group of students in the gallery and the students said to me, um, you know, I, isn't this about school shootings? They saw the apple, they saw the bullet, they saw the sort of moment of explosion and um, they connected it to something that was real in their lives. And so this was an opportunity for me to learn from them about how objects and their meaning can change over time. And they can take on sort of different uh, um, yeah, they can be, they can, they, they can, their meaning, their meaning can grow and expand. Um, and, and it changes based on who's looking at it. Um, so I do really believe museums, um, are, uh, 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 a place that you can take these challenging ideas and make them more accessible to people. You know, um, and I often say, it, instead of uh, yelling at each other, people can use the objects as punching bags. You know, students welcome opportunities to be fully engaged with provocative questions and fascinating and puzzling exhibits. Um, and I encourage students to explore ideas and communicate in ways which may not be ideal in classroom settings or might provoke strong responses. This is an image of an exhibition that we had a couple years back um, called The Trans List, which was images by the photographer Timothy Greenfield Sanders of notable people in the uh, trans community. Um, <clears throat> in, 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 a, in a way, the museum kind of became the mediator between the public and the individuals depicted. You know, um, uh, the public was able to ask questions they may not feel comfortable asking uh, the individuals in the photographs. And it was a space for them to learn through the institution. Um, we also hosted, uh, uh, at the same time, a student curated exhibition uh, featuring a selection of zines that address the daily lives experienced by queer identified people and embrace the diversity and intersectionality of the trans community, which is often glossed over by the media. So it was an opportunity for students to, 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 to sort of take what their experience was and, and, and provide a space for that in, in the museum. Um, <clears throat> you know, I truly believe that museums are spaces for public discourse, uh, where diverse people from our region, the diversity, uh, the, the, you know, the diverse student body from SUNY schools can gather to learn about and discuss not only what artists and their work can teach us about the world, about history, but also about how other members of their community and their classrooms are experiencing that work, what their truths are, how they are 
um, yeah, it, it provides them an opportunity to learn about each other. Um, and, 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 and in that, is sort of built into that is this sort of social learning opportunities that can really get students excited. Um, you know, students enjoy learning with and about their friends. While they recognize uh, that a visit to a museum is primar primarily designed by their teachers to assist in their learning, they also want a sort of satisfying social occasion when they can learn with their friends. Um, and, and studies have shown that students are more likely to remember social and personally relevant aspects of field trips, um, yet also dislike and keep less favorable um, memories of trips that seem too structured and don't leave room for their personal visit agenda. And I think that associating, associating the experience of visiting uh, or discussing the museum exhibitions with their fellow students in the context of what they're learning in the classroom can enrich that material with personal connections. Um, we can also have dance parties in museums. There, there's social spaces, right? There's spaces where um, people might expect something a little weird, um, but it also, it, 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 museums should provide these social interactions for students so that they can come to see the institution not as sort of the stuffy space packed with ancient objects, but a place where their culture is alive and yelling. Um, so you can't take your classes to museums right now, a lot of you, right? Um, I wanna say museum educators are, are your ally. Our job is to help you find ways uh, to make the museum useful for you. And a lot of us have been working on providing virtual experiences in the time of COVID-19. Uh, there's an image from our YouTube page where we've got um, uh, tours, uh, 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 recordings of, of programs, we're also able to um, connect classrooms and artists. And this is something that we found interesting in this time is that we're able to Zoom people in from across the world. Um, and a lot of museums also have, <clears throat> just gonna quickly show you this, have these, um, these kind of wonderful um, online exhibitions. We'll get to this slide, this, this later. Um, this is a, um, a tour that we have uh, of, this show New Folk, which is currently on view at the museum, and people can navigate this space. While it's not the same as visiting a museum in person, right, it can't be, um, it gives you a sense of the scale, the, the color, the texture, and you get to move around it as you may uh, a gallery. Um, thank you very much. I hope that this has sort of whet your appetite to visit museums with your classrooms. If you don't have one on your campus, we're here at SUNY New Paltz, and um, I'd be happy to welcome you uh, virtually or in person. I am going to go back to our PowerPoint, <clears throat> pardon me, and um, yeah, and welcome uh, Nicola wilson Clasby. So hello. Hey. Hello, hello everybody, and thank you, Zach, for that wonderful introduction. Okay, so my name is Nikki Wilson Clasby. I'm the composition program coordinator here at SUNY Newports, and I teach um, writing and rhetoric and also technical communication. So, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, a project that I do um, with my writing students. Um, but first of all, I want to talk about um, our wonderful museum and how. It um, provides a physical and virtual space for, for my students to experience firsthand the power of public interface writing. So I'm talking to you today, not necessarily about the art objects, but about the sort of role of the curator and the, the role of the sort of the, the writing component of the museum, which is hugely helpful um, for me and my students. So um, um, I, the power of this uh, public interface writing um, helps to uh, navigate a path through an exhibition space, guide an audience through complex visual concepts, uh, introduce uh, students to new ideas, help form uh, interesting connections, uh, prompt, most importantly, prompt curiosity to learn more about the artists and their ideas. And as Zach was saying earlier, you know, in his wonderful introduction, you know, part of the, the, the writing, the public face writing of a museum is, is also um, to help uh, visitors feel welcome um, in unfamiliar and sometimes intimidating spaces, which I think is hugely important. I'm glad uh, Zach illustrated that earlier. Um, also, um, the power of this public um, writing is to open students' minds and eyes to different ways of looking and different ways of seeing. And these are all things that I embrace in my, in my classes. And so success for me um, with our museum is, um, 
how do I see success? I see success when students experience how to harness this power that I've just been talking about into their own writing. They see it, they understand it, they experience it, and they're able to transfer it into their own writing. So that's what I'm going to talk about today with this project that I have. So um, my project, um, the, the topic of this talk is the, uh, the rhetorical function of the curatorial statement um, as a tool that I use for teaching argument and audience in academic writing. And of course, this is applicable to all types of writing. Um, so it uh, has lots of good uses here. So uh, just let me give you a little bit of context. So I teach upper levels of writing and rhetoric. And um, I, my background is actually in art and design, which is um, why I have a, a, a great connection with the museum. Um, so I bring all of my art and design uh, ideas and principles and pedagogies to the writing process. Um, because I find that um, using images um, can really help connect students to writing in really interesting ways. And that's something I explore a lot in my classes. So in order to do that, um, we in, in our rhetoric and writing classes, we have um, a concept called wicked questions, which we set for the whole semester. So um, I posit my students as what I call image detectives to help them to understand how to analyze and interpret images. And the wicked question that I set for us to answer during the course of a semester is this, how do we define the work of visual power and its effect on our culture? So one of the things that I do at the end of the semester, we have a big project. Um, it is the, the big situation-based researched academic argument paper. Um, and the title for, for this paper for my students is Curating Images Representing Others. So my prompt is this, I have a, a situational prompt. The prompt is the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art has invited a series of guest curators to stage a virtual exhibition to explore the challenges surrounding issues of representation, misrepresentation, and or underrepresentation of a famous person or character, group or community of the student's choice. Um, and you can do this with any, it doesn't have to be that particular set, but this is, you can do this with all sorts of stuff. I've done it with objects, uh, anything you can think of through any discipline. Um, it doesn't have to be specifically um, centered in art or in English. Um, so this has great you know, transfer of possibilities. So an example here is um, Mary Anning, who was a British fossil collector. She was actually a paleontologist, but because she was a woman, didn't get accepted into scientific communities. Of course, she her work was never taken seriously until more recently. And I hope you're all going to watch um, the new film Ammonite, which is coming out soon with Kate Winslet and Saoirse Ronan. So it's, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. So this is a great example of, um, of a process of bringing um, an underrepresented person um, to light. So, but students can choose whatever kind of uh, topic um, they want for this project. Um, it's, it's entirely up to them what they choose. But the task is this, um, they are tasked with um, producing a curatorial statement that explores the concept that they're de developing for the exhibition. And then after they've got that set straight, well, first of all, the, 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 let me just backtrack. The curatorial statement is really a thesis statement. It, it's a thesis statement plus a sort of um, an essay map or a road plan for or a trailer, if you like, for, for the, the, the concept, the exhibition. Um, so that's directly translatable to our writing process. Any research academic paper needs a good thesis statement and a, a roadmap for how that thesis is going to unfold. So, so they're tasked with that. Um, and then they are tasked with designing, writing and producing an exhibition catalog based on a series of images that they're collecting on their subject. Um, which includes a well-researched, well-developed expansion of the curatorial statement using academic sources from our library. So I'm very much positive, you know, putting them in the shoes of the, the curator for this project and looking at all the responsibilities that go um, with that job as a curator. So before we, um, after the students have sort of got an idea of what they're doing, um, they've, they've chosen the subject, they've got some slides together, we need then to think about how to uh, go about setting up the curatorial statement, looking at its function, um, et cetera. So I have them look at, uh, I go have them surf the net for um, curatorial statements from um, exhibitions from other you know, big museums and we take a look at them. So 
we read them and we discuss um, the role of the curator, all the different levels of jobs, you know, the, the fact that they have to balance between their, you know, their academic knowledge, the demands of the museum, the demands of the, the public, and also, you know, respect for the artists too. So we look at that complicated role and how that might um, sort of manifest itself in the writing. We look at the mission and the ethos of the museum, you know, the caliber of, of writing and the caliber of, of ideas and the, the aligned with the goals of the museum. Um, we evaluate um, the concept, of course, for the exhibition. Also the location and the audience, where is this museum located? What kind of people come to see it? Um, and then we talk about the language and effectiveness of the curatorial statement um, with, its, with, a, with its goal of reaching out to that specific audience to make them feel included and not alienated and this is a fun exercise because we find that a lot of curatorial statements do a great job of alienating their audience um, and confusing um, um, the, the goals and the objects of the, of the exhibition and some are really good at it so it's a really good um, it's, a, it's a great way to get students introduced um, to the nature of that kind of writing so the next part of this is I want them to experience what this is like. So I send my students then to the Dorsky Museum to go visit an exhibition. In this case, this was the one on Andy Warhol. They go in cold turkey, not having read anything about the exhibition whatsoever. And I have them spend about 10 minutes looking around the exhibition, tracking their, their, their bearings, how they move around the exhibition space, um, what they gravitate towards, how they feel when they're looking around, and then what they understand the exhibition to be about. And once they've spent 10 minutes doing that, we get together and we talk about their experiences. And um, I wanna show you some of their responses, um, which I think is quite typical of, um, of what students experience when they come in cold turkey. So for instance, Cassandra says, of the uh, Andy Warhol's exhibit. My first expectations of Andy Warhol's ex exhibition in the Dorsky Museum were not very high. I thought it would be just another English assignment and nothing special. See, this is very revealing stuff about students' attitudes. Uh, once I got there, my expectations stood correct. His photos were confusing and I thought all over the place. So this is really interesting. This is really good feedback actually of what it's like sort of coming in cold turkey and not really understanding what's going on. Bryn says, um, and this is really interesting, Bryn says, this was my first time stepping into an art museum without being forced by my parents. How sad is that? Um, but it's sad but true. Um, she says, when I walked over to the Andy Warhol exhibit, I was a bit confused. Just looking at the art by, by itself, I didn't really understand the true meaning of the exhibition. So I think this is very telling and this is exciting. And I'm glad they had these kinds of responses because after we did this, I then got them to read the curatorial statement. And of course, so uh, for marking time, Andy Warhol's vision of celebrations, commemorations and anniversaries written by Reva Wolf, got them to read it, to figure out what was going on, spend time really analyzing um, the language and the ideas. Um, and then I let them, uh, re-explore the exhibition after having read the statement and then also track again how they were feeling how they um how they understood the concept of the exhibition and then they had to write a response um to that and um and post it to me and the responses are really interesting so i'm just going to read two of them here what i do with these responses then is that i use them in a classroom and we go through what the students are actually saying and how that translates to writing a research paper. So for instance, Cassandra says, after reading the curatorial statement of the Andy Warhol exhibit, it's clear the exhibition displays different ways of presenting time markers in our lives, so concept. Warhol explores the, explored the social and personal importance of these time markers. He split his idea into categories, including commemoration, celebrations, and anniversaries. So we can talk about organization of ideas here, organization of concept. I found it interesting how the exhibition in the Dorsky Museum organized the display by having each wall of the room to represent a different category, directly translatable to organizing your paragraphs with your different topics and concepts going on here. Um, this helps the viewer to understand exactly where they are and what they are looking at. So thinking about your audience and how your audience is going to interpret your ideas. So we can plug into that, you know, transitions and all that good writing stuff that helps an audience get to grips with your writing. Um, the curatorial statement affects the way the artwork will be seen because it tells the viewer what to expect. 
So again, we have, we can talk about issues of genre and how to follow genre rules to make sure people do get what they expect to see. Um, it also acts as a connector of all the categories in the exhibition. So again, connecting ideas and the language that we need to do that, we can talk about that in our essays. Uh, one might think the images are supposed to stand alone if he or she did not read the curator's statement. Um, the viewer is aided by the background information when moving through the exhibition. This it directly relates to context. This is the importance of context. Uh, and then, however, the curatorial statement leaves much information to be discovered through the displays of the images. And this part was really exciting. I'm really glad the student uh, picked up on that because, you know, this means that the student is thinking about how to invite the viewer into your paper, not dictate to them what they're saying, but, but engage the, the reader in their own writing. So there's lots of really good stuff in there. This student had no idea that they that's what they were doing when they wrote this piece, but this is, this is exactly what they're doing. And I can use this then to teach about um, how to structure a paper. Um, oops, next one, sorry. Um, Bryn says, once I read the curatorial statement though, it all came together. I was actually intrigued and realized Andy Warhol had been un underestimated by me. So here we have, you know, an example of curiosity being, being peaked here. And um, the statement explained each photo and why he did what he did. For example, his image was the Brooklyn Bridge, was confusing to me at first glance. I honestly didn't even know what bridge it was when I looked at it, which explains more how uneducated I was about Andy's photos and bridges. So, you know, we can talk a lot about evidence here and how evidence really helps clarify, you know, research and evidence helps clarify issues. Um, after reading the statement, the random picture of a bridge turned into my favorite Andy Warhol expression. So this is a great, you know, lovely, way of talking about an invitation into a piece of work and an invitation to connect. Um, I learned why the picture was photographed the way it was to highlight the Gothic style of the bridge. I had no idea that it was even Gothic style architecture. So great um, evidence here of students, you know, connecting and learning, um, which is good stuff. So, um, so even though it's little small informal pieces of writing, we can learn a lot from these um, experiences and transfer them over. So, after doing this kind of exercise, as simple as this exercise is, um, I find that students are kind of better equipped, equipped with a sort of better understanding of the rhetorical situation of the exhibition space in terms of ethos, pathos, and logos, and as experienced through all of these different things, like what it feels like to be lost within an exhibition space, which is really not fun, uh, confused about the purpose of an exhibition, um, the, the need for clear public interface writing to welcome and guide visitors to the museum and educate them about the artwork and seeing, and also this is a really important point for this particular project, seeing the aesthetic and design quality standards that the museum upholds as part of its own ethos, which is um, if, I'm, if students are going to be curating a, a virtual show for the museum, they need to see um, what those expectations are. So we talk about that and then the students are ready to apply that knowledge to their own virtual exhibition projects. And just here um, on this side of the screen, you have some uh, cover pages of some of the catalogs that my students um, produced where they're trying to sort of um, imitate the, the, the um, aesthetics of the museum and create visually engaging uh, book covers to entice the audience in to read about their work. Um, and so to finish up then, um, actually Zach, we can just go straight down to that link if you like. Um, I wanna show you, this is just one example of a fully finished catalog that one of my students produced on the Inuit Indians. And this is actually available on our um, university website because this was published in our um, catalog, um, um, Visions and, oh, what's it called? Um, Oh, I can't remember. I'll have to send that to you. Um, but this, this, so this, this was produced on Google Slides, um, and it's um, so through this process, I'm able to teach students about good presentation skills, um, especially skills that they need for um, doing PowerPoints. But this is, you know, essentially Google Slides being used as a desktop publishing to produce um, a fully fledged book. And as you can see, those students were required to work from the front cover, table of contents through the curatorial statement to then displaying the images that they've chosen and the academic research part about the connections between um, those images and um, the issues that are at stake in, in this case, misrepresentation of uh, Inuk women. Um, and um, the student was able to embody a lot of the sort of uh, the concepts of, of living out in, in that kind of environment into her visual design. 
so um, this is a really nice exercise to get students to consider the importance of not just what they write, but how they present their writing to a pop to a, a general audience to invite that general audience to come in and read and enjoy the experience of reading. And then at the end, if you push go right down to the end, I got the students on the back page, the back cover to write a little um, curator's profile of themselves to explain why, what, why they picked this particular um, group of people to, to write about. And for this student, um, the, the contact point was um, music. Um, she was very much into one, um, Inuit um, uh, woman's music that she really loved and that was her doorway into the project. Um, so connecting now the personal you know, personal interests um, to the project itself. Um, so that's all I have for you. This, this is a great project for, for teaching um, just basic principles of academic writing, but trying to get students engaged um, in something that they really enjoy, but also get them out there to see what the museum is about and you know, what kind of careers are available um, with writing also. So it covers a lot of ground. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy and consider it. You can, you can use these skills, you can use a museum and this kind of project to apply to any kind of research project using visuals as like lovely little rabbit holes for disappearing into and coming up with really engaging and interesting research, uh, which is what curators do. I mean, that's their, that's their job, which is amazing. All right, so thank you very much for your time and attention. And I, we will, I'll pass you back to Zach and oh, Moshe. Okay, all right, thank you everybody. Hi, my name is Moshe Cohen, and maybe I'm a little bit of the black sheep in this bunch because I'm a STEM professor. I see Roberta asked about biology. Are there any other STEM people in the room? You're welcome to comment about what departments you're in. Um, so I am really into visual mathematics. Uh, one of the, the mathematical topics that I study is I study knots. And in a few minutes, when I'm going to the next slide, I'll, I'll hold up a picture of a three-dimensional knot. Um, but I'm really into um, trying to help students go back and forth between looking at a, a mathematical image and trying to get some ideas from this. And that mathematical image could be a formula, it could be a, a triangle, it could be any of these things. Um, and uh, the, the topic that I'll be talking about today is going to be a geometry class. So I'm sure you all remember high school geometry, maybe not with such positive uh, insights. Um, but the, the course that I'll be talking about is a course that dives deep into understanding that geometry. And the students in this class, because it's a, an upper division class, are going to be uh, math majors and math education majors. Uh, so here is my knot. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to be um, contacted by Zach, uh, who, who told me about this amazing exhibit that just happened to coincide when I was going to teach this geometry course. This is one of our writing intensive courses in the major. And because it's one of our big ones, um, uh, students want to take it. So we offer it like every semester. Um, in my student learning outcomes for this particular class, I include this demonstrate ability to think critically by recognizing patterns. And this fits in with this idea of an axiomatic development. Problem one is gonna be used in problem two. Problem two is gonna be used in problem three. So I want them, when they get to problem 20, I want them to see the depth of all the other problems that they saw before. I wanna see, I wanna uh, help them see that there's a pattern from 20 that goes all the way back down to one. And this is a so-called axiomatic development. And I view this in the same way as um, when you stare at a painting, you would really like to see all that depth. You would like to see not just you know, the surface level, but what are all the layers of meaning there? Um, and so I was very happy uh, about this exhibit. Um, but in general, in all of my math classes, I tell students that I want them to learn how to communicate. and um, that means writing better and that means speaking better. And there is, you know, some uh, negative stereotypes about mathematicians not being great communicators. So I want these students to grow up um, and be effective communicators. 
Uh, so Zach shared this um, exhibit with me. Oh, go back just a little bit. You can see staring at these pictures, how incredible they are. There's, there's lines, there's triangles, there's shapes. Um, and so there's something so visually, um, I don't know, this is the, the scene when you walk into the room, uh, it's daunting. I mean, these pictures are huge. They go all the way up to the ceiling. I even included the reflection in the floor because you can really see all these things. Um, and so uh, this exhibit by uh, recently deceased uh, Leonard Contino, I thought was perfect for my class. Um, so I had the first, uh, the first class in the gallery do the following, walk in, take a, a tour all around the gallery, and then choose some piece that spoke to you. And that, um, that piece you know, could speak to you for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, so then I asked the students to grab a chair, stand in front or sit in front of their piece and start to journal um, about it. And so first I asked, how did you even get to the piece? Like how, uh, what is your spatial reasoning? So when you walk in, is it on your left? Is it behind you? Where, wherever it happens to be. And um, this kind of spatial reasoning is again, something that's very important in math classes, especially in geometry. Then I want them to describe the piece. For example, a picture is worth a thousand words. So what are a thousand words that you can tell me about this? So here you see a student is drawing a bunch of, uh, or is writing about a bunch of shapes. So describe those triangles, describe those squares, um, and really to find a, 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 a language to be able to talk about these things. It, it happens in a lot of different math classes. Um, and then I want them to talk about the math that they see. Um, again, here were a lot of um, triangles and squares, but in the other pictures, there were lots of other shapes. And then this was the big thing. I wanted them to talk to me about why they chose the piece and, and what they got out of it. So then uh, what I did for homework was I said, here's the writing assignment. Part one is I want you to give me all the facts, facts about the artist, facts about the art that you've chosen, facts, uh, you know, descriptions of that art. And then in number two, uh, part two of that project, I want them to react personally. Um, and specifically, I want them to react personally to the mathematics, the visual, the geometry going on. So this happened to be the one, um, the piece that I re reacted personally to. Um, but I, I want them to just come to me with wherever they're at and what it connected to you uh, about and what it made you feel and what that mathematics is telling you. And then here was the third project. The third project, they had to write it down, but ultimately it was an oral presentation. They had two to three minutes and they were to just do something creative. So some of them, um, oh, uh, and this oral presentation happened on our second gallery meeting. Uh, we came back to the gallery. We started at the beginning of the exhibit and walked all the way around. And when we came up to a painting that a student had chosen or a piece that the student had chosen, they stood in front of us and, and gave this presentation. And these presentations were so creative. A uh, student wrote a poem. Um, a student uh, wrote a short story based on a piece, but for many of them, many of them chose autobiographical things. They, they described how the piece reminded them of home uh, where they lived before um, coming to New Paltz. Several of them described their experience at New Paltz, especially as a math major in New Paltz. And I thought that was incredible. Uh, one of them, actually uh, spoke a little bit and then did a performance using her hula hoop, uh, which blew me away. Um, and so I, I'm really happy that Zach talked about learning about each other because this was an opportunity for me to learn more about them and for them to learn more about each other. Um, so Zach gave us a really cool activity at the end of it, which was to take a roll of tape that was colored and draw some picture on the floor. So um, you can see in orange uh, right below me, that picture on the floor was a mathematical theorem 
that the painting on the previous slide invoked for me. And uh, maybe my students get, didn't get so much out of it, but this theorem is actually closely related to my own research. So I was so excited to talk to them about it, but he had everyone create some other image. And then we talked about how our images were connected and how we interpreted each other's pieces. And again, I thought this was really great about um, like, communal learning and really learning in community and uh, making sure that we could understand where each other was coming from. Um, so in the last little bit, I wanna tell you about um, my student reactions. So my student evaluation of instructions, I added a single question that had a bunch of prompts in it about their field trip uh, to the, the gallery. Uh, what did you think about the project? Did you enjoy it? Did it contribute, it contribute to your appreciation of geometry? Did it contribute to your writing process? And then um, I've highlighted these things. So the red is where they wrote something that's kind of negative. The, the blue is where they wrote something positive and the white was sort of these ambivalent um, statements. But you can see that for a bunch of them, this was pretty scary. Um, there was stress. <laughs> they, they were like, what does this even have to do with math? Um, but even though they said that, some of them said it was interesting. Some of them, it was fun. Uh, someone said they enjoyed it because it wasn't related to math class. Um, and then there were some ambivalent comments there, but let's go on to the next slide. So I... Um, only 16 of my students responded and I'm giving you all 16. So this isn't cherry picked, this is the entire list. Um, some students said at the beginning they didn't enjoy it at all or they you know, were worried about it. It was out of their comfort zone. But then after having gone through the experience, they were able to benefit from them. It, it helped them organize their writing. It helped them improve their public speaking skills, which again are skills that they need no matter what their majors are when they get to the job market. Um, uh, again, someone points out it was very unusual to do something like that in math class. Um, and then these students, um, so you see that like not a lot of them wrote super negative things. They all pretty much enjoyed the experience, but this set of students really, really dove deep. They went really deep here and talked about how um, it helped them think creatively it helped them think of geometry differently. And again, I had a lot of um, future teachers in the room. So I was very excited about giving them that kind of inspiration so that they could turn, uh, turn that over to their students one day. Um, and I'll just say at the bottom that one of them had never been in this uh, Dorsky Museum before. And so again, um, opportunities like this really, um, you know, you might think, oh, it's just a math class, but somehow I'm able to unlock these opportunities that a lot of these students haven't had before. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Aaron Ricciardi. Um, I'm a visiting assistant professor of creative writing in the English department at New Paul. Um, I'm a playwright and a musical theater writer, so I mainly I specialize in the department on dramatic writing, but I also teach more general creative writing courses uh, where we focus on fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and playwriting. And I also teach some literature courses. And um, so the thing I want to talk about today is, is finding inspiration for creative writing. I'm curious if there's anyone here who also teaches creative writing. If you do, feel please let me know in the, in the chat. Um, but finding inspiration for creative writing is always an ineffable task and is usually near impossible, especially for beginning writers. So often I have students say, I don't know what to write about. And that's something that I think too in my own work. I'm currently working on a new musical and I feel like 90% of the time my collaborator and I spend writing, we're just scratching our heads going, what should the song be about? What should the song be about? And I think that the reason that artists get overwhelmed about generation of their work is not because there's nothing to write about, but because there's everything to write about. And the generation of work is often about limitation and finding that correct doorway that your key will open into the gigantic building that is the creative process. Um, did I do it right? Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so describing and demonstrating how I use visual art to help students find their way into writing. Um, I use it to as a tool to write fiction, but you could do it for anything, for writing plays, for writing poetry, for writing nonfiction. And I use it, I use the artwork to help the students see how to translate what they're seeing into things like setting, character, plot, tone, metaphor, language. It's an activity that involves going to a museum to engage with the artwork there in person or virtually. I'm actually doing this activity tomorrow in my intro to creative writing classes using a virtual tour of the museum that Zach showed us earlier, this really great um, technology that the Dorsky Museum on our campus has been using. And the world that we're currently living in, I have noticed over the last seven or eight months, has all turned to art and art making and consumption of art. You talk to anyone right now and you say, how are you spending your time? What are you streaming? What are you reading? What are you making? What are you baking? In this time of crisis, we have all turned to either consuming art or making art, consuming creativity or making creativity. And the first thing that this exercise I'm gonna tell you about does is that it expands for students the understanding of what art even is how visual art in a museum, published writing that we study in class together, and their own writing, and the stuff that we stream, the stuff that we read on our own, all of that is creative work. And I think it's something that students don't necessarily put, their, put together in their minds, especially if they come from families that don't um, prioritize art or revere art. I find often that those families who tell their students that they can't have a career in the arts, those are the same families that sit at home watching TV all day, which makes me want to say to people like that, who do you think makes that television that you watch all day? And, um, and, and so the museum can really help make that argument for students. Um, it also brings a level of excitement to the engagement with art because field trips are kind of fun. They have a little bit of pageantry about them. You get on the bus, you go to a new space, the next thing that it can do is that it can expand a student's understanding of literary terms or literary concepts. So for instance, when we're talking about tone in say a short story, that might be difficult for a student to wrap their minds around, but if we're talking about tone in a painting, that is perhaps easier for some students to see and make that connection to. And then, um, the third thing that this can do is that it can expand the students' approaches to generating new creative work. Um, as I said earlier, the greatest hurdle often in art making is getting started. And there are many entryways to that kind of inspiration, and this is just one of them. So the thing that you would do in this activity, the thing that I do in this activity, is that we visit the museum either in person or virtually, as I'll be doing tomorrow. And then the students will go off and explore the works that are on display at the museum. And once they've gravitated toward one or a few works of art, um, I tell them to pick one or more, one or a few. And then I will lead them in a writing exercise, which is what I'm gonna do right now with all of you. So now take out a paper and pen or open a blank document on your computer because we're gonna do a little bit of writing. I'll give you a second to do that. So I'm going to use for our example exercise here today, this painting that was in the Dorsky Museum of Art, which is called The Red, ba the Red Barn, which is by a, uh, a local, an artist that's local to New Paltz named Phyllis Gay Palmer. That's her website there, phyllispalmerart.com. So I have a student who, whose name is Laura, and Laura, um, I took in one of, uh, she was in a class of mine that I took to the museum and she gravitated toward this painting. So I would like all of us today to write about this painting. So the first thing that I'll have students do is I'll say, I want you to write down five, as I would call them, expensive words. I use that term a lot in my, in my teaching, expensive versus inexpensive or expensive versus cheap. What I mean by that is words that are kind of fancy, 
words that are big or that readers might not hear a lot in their day-to-day -day lives or read a lot in the things that they read. Um, I think we have a lot of we have a limited amount of real estate or currency in the minds of our audiences when we're making art. And so expensive words cost a lot for a reader because they have to think for a while about what that word might mean if it's not recognizable in them. So take a second to write down five expensive words that this painting makes you think of. If I was doing this, I would probably write pastoral which I feel like is a word that we don't hear of a lot, but this painting makes me think of it. I'm gonna do this kind of in an expedited way. So we're gonna move on to the next one. The next thing that I'll do is probably expect it. I'll have the students write down five inexpensive words. So one word that I might write down for this would be country or even barn. And the next thing that I'll say is, I want you to write down the last line of a novel that was inspired by this painting. Go right to the end of the story. Pretend you've written the whole novel. What's the last line? And feel free to use any of the 10 words that you wrote down in steps one or two. And now the next thing I'll have the student do is I'll say, I want you to pick an area of inspiration. Pick something that this painting is going to inspire in your story, just to get started. And the options I'll give them are setting, character, plot, metaphor, or tone. So if there's something about this painting that you connect to on the level of a setting, the student could detail the setting of their story. And again, I use this for fiction. So they could write, they could pick that area of setting to think about for their short story. Or character. Is there a character that they're seeing in this painting that's coming to perhaps the farmer, perhaps the farmer's cousin who lives in the big city, perhaps someone coming to stay at an Airbnb that is that, that's what this barn actually is. Um, or is it plot? Is there a story that they're seeing here? Um, if it was E.B. White looking at this, would E.B. White think of Wilbur and Charlotte? Um, or metaphor, do you see that the squirrels in this painting represent metaphor in some way? Or are you attracted to the tone of it, the chaos of this painting? It looks kind of quaint, but there's actually a kind of chaos to it with all the leaves and all the squirrels. It looks like the squirrels are about to take over the barn. Is that what the student's attracted to, the, the, the tone of, um, the tone of a placid feeling with chaos right on top of it. And so then what I'll have the students do is detail the category they chose in either a paragraph or bullet points or whatever. Just write about it for a while. Write about the thing, write about the character, write about the plot, write about the metaphor or the tone. I'll give you a minute to do that. And feel free to use any of those 10 words that you wrote down at the beginning, any of the expensive words or the inexpensive words. Let's say about 15 seconds. All right, we'll move on to the next one. And now what I would have those students do is start their story, or if you're doing it for a different medium other than fiction, you start your poem, 
start your scene. And so I'll give you uh, about another minute, maybe less, to start your story right now. or let's say 15 more seconds. So that was a really rapid fire uh, example of that exercise that normally takes about a half hour. Um, and so I told you earlier that I that that painting was selected by a student of mine when she visited the museum. And so I just want to share with you in closing uh, what this student, Laura Minnett, wrote in uh, inspired by that painting. So I'll read a little bit of it. The story is called Squirrel Breath. Gary Crow's house reeked of a cigarette stale sour breath and phantom floral perfume. A dense sweaty heat smothered the house's interior. The TV room proudly exhibited Juni Crow's stained yellow armchair, its centerpiece. Its mustard linen stunk like a swamp, black, sugarless always, coffee stains, sweat, and Gary's ejaculate blemished its yellow daisies. An ugly gash wounded its deflated cushion, a Cheshire grin that vomited yellow cotton. He smeared dark chocolate into the bony, rigid yellow arms. When Junie was alive, she'd suffocate the fabric with a plastic slipcover. Junie constantly throttled her son's hobbies. She loathed morbidity. This confused Gary as she'd insisted that her son adopt a hobby, explaining that he'd never attract a woman without that. He couldn't depend on his appearance to ensnare a mate and had to adapt survivalism. Occasionally, he, her bejeweled thumb would censor the scar next to his mouth and she'd sigh, tears wetting her artificial lashes. You could have been so attractive. And isn't amazing that this student created this lush, vivid, rich world with these wooden spaces and characters, real feeling characters that all came out of that painting that she happened to see at the museum that day. That day. And, a final additional fun fact about this story is that she ended up writing the paintings into the story that the paintings actually lived in the character's house. That's all from me. I hope you can utilize some of what I shared with you today in your own teaching. Okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna raise this pine cone that's to say to move on. So uh, I'm Dr. Alex Pei. I'm associate professor of music and piano, and I'm also the chair, associate chair of the music department. Um, my work kind of revolves around um, contemporary work. I also um, am very interested in um, Burmese and Greek piano styles. So I'm kind of um, use my classical training to kind of explore uh, other pathways. Um, I also teach music in the community as a K through 12 teacher. So my role as an educator um, is to really get students to question who they perform for, what they're performing, how they do it, and where they do it. Um, I really want them to think about their roles as musicians today and how to thrive. Um, and especially now in COVID-19, where all performances are shut down, you know, how do we thrive as musicians today? And that's a really important and vital question. And what I've loved about the museum is that it's been a space to really um, turn everything on its head and to really look at these questions from scratch. So it's been a really an open and experimental space for me where students can kind of redefine and rethink the way a performance should work. Um, it, we've primarily used the Dorsey Museum as a performance space, but um, it really goes way beyond. Uh, it's been an, in, an interdisciplinary space where music and art can come together. It is a place where movement could happen. It's a large space. Um, it is not a concert hall, right? And because it's not a concert hall, it allows students and myself to kind of redefine and reimagine what the performance experience would be for somebody and what are other ways in which we could um, connect with audiences and build new audiences, right? And in COVID-19, um, this has kind of taken that exercise to the next level where we 
no longer have a physical space. So how can the virtual space of the Dorsky Museum, its online platforms such as Instagram, um, Facebook, and its website, how can we use that as a performance platform? So there are two projects that I did. Um, the first, a physical project, and the second, which is a virtual one. So we did a concert called Debussy and Tonalism, which explored the close relationship between um, the music of French composer Claude Debussy and uh, American tonalist painters Inez and Whistler. And this is a common misperception. When we think of Claude Debussy, we think of the pastel colors of the French Impressionists, right? But actually it was Debussy's fascination with the dark, moody, somber colors of Whistler and Inez that catapulted a whole new um, artistic trajectory where Debussy moved into modernism uh, midway through his life and abandoned Claire de Lune and the kind of romantic pastel notions of moonlight with a dark, sinister kind of horror vision in black and gray. And so, um, we did a concert where the piano students performed Debussy's preludes, uh, all featuring kind of these bleak winter landscapes, um, footsteps in the snow, dead leaves, mists, things like this. And taking a look at some of these American tonalist painters whom Debussy absolutely adored and um, wrote about and actually accredited um, his artistic inspiration. So, um, we were thinking, um, how could we, you know, the students came to the museum, they, they looked at the artwork, spoke with Zach, and we each picked a painting that related to the piece that they were studying. But then we thought, how could we unify the art music experience so that we could um, reveal this inspiration and how could um, audience members appreciate this? So the goal for us was to unify this experience and to think, innovatively to reimagine re the concert. So the, the typical solution would be to kind of just have a concert in the museum, but we thought, wouldn't it be great if audience members could actually choose to either look at the painting or listen to the music and kind of be participants in this experience where they could actually look at the muted grays of the Whistler while listening to Debussy's music and kind of put those connections for themselves. And when we thought, okay, so if we wanted them to be able to move about the space, right? A, a normal concert space and here's where the, the Dorsky Museum has, a, has, has an advantage. The seats are not fixed. So in a normal concert space, everyone would be in rows staring at a stage. But um, we thought, the students and I, we, we thought to reinvent the way people might sit in a concert, right? Some facing paintings, some facing audience members, and to create these aisles so that people could move while they listen to the music. Now this um, idea then, asked, you know, challenge the students to think, well, what if people move very loudly? Like how, how would we control, how would we still keep that quiet um, atmosphere of Debussy while having people move? So we brought in dance professor Nina Yerka to teach the audience how to move mindfully and slowly through the space in a kind of like Qigong, like Tai Chi exercise. So we kind of incorporated this concert experience to be part movement part visual, part oral, and that uh, participants could kind of focus on what they liked or what they felt was relevant to them. So uh, in these pictures, you see that's the, our dress rehearsal. Um, and then the perform you see the second picture is the actual performance and people chose to stand, people chose to stand while watching and people chose to sat to listen. And at the very end, um, I did a performance and it was kind of this like, cool dance piece where people kind of circulated around the room really slowly and then sort of settled into their seats um, towards the end, which was kind of how we were envisioning it. Um, so I performed with my students and this was kind of a collaborative moment. Okay, the second project is a virtual project. Um, it was originally supposed to take place in person, but uh, because of COVID-19, it shut down our performance spaces. So we thought, this was a great opportunity to re-envision how to perform in COVID-19. So um, you see pictures of um, the performers. Henry is a pianist at the Gita Music Institute in Yangon, Myanmar. Um, he's really connected 
um, with my personal research in Burmese music. Sophia is a local Hudson Valley High School student, and Simone is a SUNY New Paltz music major. So the broad outlines of this project was to create a community and support the community of local pianists um, and music teachers, and to create a performance opportunity um, from their homes where um, performances were being canceled. So we leveraged the benefits of the internet in order to connect to different audiences. Um, <clears throat> the Dorsky Museum has a large thriving Facebook and Instagram page. So we thought, how could we connect to different audiences that typically don't come to the music department shows? Um, we thought, how can we connect to pianists internationally? Um, how can we find pianists all stuck in their homes um, to kind of relate music and art together? So um, this was just a really another opportunity to engage um, students to think about new performance formats. So <clears throat> the, oh no, let's go back. So the, the main outlines of the project, um, Frederick Chopin is a Polish composer and it's a relationship between the music of Chopin and the artwork of Jan Sofka, who is a, a Polish artist. And both are political refugees, both uh, their work really centered around concepts of memory, nostalgia and kind of displacement. And we thought this was a perfect time during COVID-19 where we're all sort of displaced from our homes. So, the prompt was simple. We asked students to perform a piece, record it on their iPhones or whatever way, and to reflect on the piece, a memory, like what asked, answered the question, what does this piece remind me of? And then we, they would use this memory as a starting point to access the images of Jan Sofka, where he kind of made these postcards of moments in his life, memories of places. So uh, we asked students to find a painting and that would relate with their piece and with their memory and to share that in a video, a composite video of their performance and of them speaking about it. This project brought together um, digital media and journalism students, um, audio engineering students um, from New Paltz to kind of produce these videos. And it's gonna uh, take place November 13th, 2020 on Dorsky website, Instagram and Facebook. So like us to check out this project, which is gonna launch real soon. So far we've collected <clears throat> over 40 videos of pianists all throughout the world. So in the top corner, you see Danae Evans. Let's just hear a little bit. Hi everyone, my name is Danae Evans and I've been playing piano for about eight or nine years now. So the piece I will be playing for this project is Chopin's Doctrine in B Major, Opus 32, Number 1. The piece overall is very serene and tranquil, but towards the end, it suddenly becomes very harsh almost and very dark and eventually ends in B minor. The memory that this piece reminds me of, it happened when I was about five or six, and me and my family went hiking, and I remember there were these waterfalls that ran parallel to the trail. And those, like the movement of the water, the oscillations, the sound of the water, very much remind me of the long chord progressions and the arpeggios that happened throughout the piece. However, then the sky clouded up very suddenly and became very dark and it started pouring rain. And I remember there was a lot of thunder and lightning and which very much reminds me of the abrupt chords that happen in the end of the piece. This also reminds me of uh, the postcard number 23, the storm. And it's pretty much how the sky looked, how it was almost completely black. But here and there, you could just see these little patches of green and blue and purple. And in a way, looking back on it, it was very pretty, but not great for us because we had to trudge through the pouring rain. So here's the piece. Thank you. 
Okay, so <clears throat> this is kind of a nice sampling. Uh, the picture on the all the way to the right is David Mosca. He's our digital media and journalism student um, who put all of these videos together. We've been getting submissions from all over the world. Um, Aram Mahadesian is from Cyprus, and he talks about um, a, a memory of his in while he was in Greece. Uh, Priscilla Dantas, uh, all the way to the right. This. She is a Brazilian pianist, and she talks about memories of uh, being a first-time immigrant to um, Europe and, and feeling very sad in this, being experiencing the snow for the first time. Um, we have Burmese pianist down at the bottom here, in between Simone down here, uh, and he, Chan Chan, um, talks a, a lot about, uh, is playing a, a beautiful Chopin Nocturne and um, reflects on his memories as well. So we kind of have this like really lovely community that we've built of piano majors, pianists. And what was really cool is we had these Zoom sessions over the summer to kind of unfold the project and they got to actually meet each other and talk to each other um, across time zones. So that's been something really cool. So, um, I, basically, just to sum up um, what I'm really interested in doing, um, and I think that the museum supports this, is to really create an Arbus that thinks really creatively, collaboratively, and in an interdisciplinary way in order to build community with their performance projects. And um, it's really necessary at this, this crossroads in time. So um, yeah, I've really used the Dorsky Museum as like a playground to kind of experiment and to play. Thanks. Um, I just want to say as the um, director of the Faculty Center how fantastic it is to see so many. Um, should I put mine on? Sorry, Nikki and I are in the same room. Is that working? Um, how fantastic it is to see the innovation of these teachers and to see what Zach has done by bringing us all and welcoming, welcoming us into the museum. So we have three minutes left. I don't know whether to zoom through my slides or open it for questions and because we wanted to have some time to question. Should I speak for really, really briefly? Um, okay, so this is a shared collaborative applied learning experience in a contemplative space. I want you to stretch your arms and your legs and feel the floor under you and think about how nostalgic we are for places where we can all be together with our students. And as several of you have said, it's so important for them to learn to interact and to be together in relationship in, a, in this sort of space. When I go to the museum, I realize, oh, some students are really tall and some are really small. And I realize that I've been at the head of the class as the professor and they've been hiding behind their desks and the whole dynamic of the learning experience changes radically, which is so valuable. Um, so my definitions of success are um, a space for critical thinking. I teach a lot of literary theory. Um, I teach a lot about how meanings are made and generated in space. Um, next, um, what we're doing is we are exposing our students um, so that they can notice the commonalities across genre and media. They can identify assumptions, including norms and values and culture. We talk a lot about art being an arbiter of culture, of, of not just representing the world, but impacting the world and guiding us to think certain things are normal, certain things are valuable, certain things are worth our time. Um, as you've probably noticed, our students are quite skeptical about meanings. They're expecting to be deceived. They're wondering what's true and what's not and that the meanings are negotiated all the time. So they're very primed to talk about um, this, this question of signification and meaning making. Um, they learn to empathize with different perspectives as so many of you have already demonstrated. Um, so, as many of you have said too, you prime them for it. Have you been to a museum? Usually 10% of my students have never been to a museum. Afterwards, how does that experience exist in your memory? What are those most vivid things you recall and you hang on to from your few minutes, your one class period or two at the museum? What would you tell a colleague? How do you become an expert and invite your peers into the museum? Um, this is one of um, the objects. We have 9,000, um, objects in the Dorsky Museum. If you don't have a museum, you could make a pop-up exhibition or you could invite um, regional artists in. People love to talk about this one as, um, oh, whoops, you can go back, never mind. 
you could go back. <laughs> um, it's a found object. We can talk about environmental sustainability. We can talk about the natural and the industrial coming together. If we have biology students, we can talk about a wounded tree. Is this tree wounded or is it being repaired with a zipper? We can talk about the commodification of nature. Nature becomes an object. We can talk about how humans want to project the human onto anything. It almost looks like a person. It doesn't take much for us to read personhood into something. Um, is it a gendered object since we say men wear the pants? Has that changed in the 21st century? Um, is this an example of, um, of the industrial zipper that's been mass produced by a proletariat that had no um, opportunity to express his or her or their species being? Is this an example of generation or of decay? Shall I keep going? I guess I'll keep going. Um, if you use the sustainable development goals, you can do a lot with that. Um, with portraits, we can go on. <clears throat> um, portraits are a wonderful thing to discuss with literature students who are used to thinking about characterization of people in literature. And then you go into the museum, all of a sudden you're talking about negotiating identities. Who gets to determine other people's identities? Who gets to tell the story? And what a powerful place that is in a work of literature, but also in a visual, visual image. And this is a, a portrait made by one of our professors who's very um, concerned about the depicted subject. And now we have a fire truck going by um, and what it means to be the subject of an artwork and to be the depicted object of someone else's gaze. Chris, I'll just keep going. You can say when we need to stop. <laughs> well, we do have uh, poster sessions for the lunch hour, so we do have yeah, to transition yeah. to them soon. But um, okay. I just want to say that this was really an amazing presentation. I'm so glad that we have it now. I mean, I just think that, you know, a museum, you're so lucky to have a, it sounds like a really fantastic museum on your campus that, you know, and, and I think interdisciplinary learning is sort of uh, museums as spaces for interdisciplinary learning sounds like, you know, it's just a no brainer as far as I'm concerned. And you all provided such great examples. So thank you so much to everyone. And, you know, if you want to stick around for a minute and see if anybody has questions in the chat, we could do that there. Um, but thank you all so much. And thank you, Sarah, for pulling it all together. Yeah, I think Sarah is, it, it deserves so much credit as the uh, director of the Faculty Development Center here at SUNY New Paltz. I mean, she's really why all of these professors and I have connected. She's been a great uh, 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 advocate for using the museum and introduced me to these people and has really made this. And I think it's the, it's sort of the, the it gives you why the Faculty Development Center matters so much is that it provides opportunities for connections uh, just like this conference does. Um, so thank you, Chris, but also thank you, very much thank you Sarah Wyman, who's a true, she's a true legend at SUNY New Paltz. Thank you all so much. Okay, stop the recording. <laughs>